Hi, and welcome to the Brisbane Professionals Podcast. This is a podcast brought to you by SMS Law, going through the legal secrets that will benefit you and your clients, as well as having a little bit of fun as we go. This podcast is designed to educate you on, number one, complicated legal terms that we will explain in an easy to understand manner, two, to understand why you do things from a legal perspective in your business, and three, to help you develop a plan for the future success of your business. Our mission is to help empower small to medium-sized businesses around the world to get access to legal advice so that they can help build their communities and make the world a better place. Did you know that any business owner is on average seven months away from losing everything? That is the average time that it takes from a successful business to fold when an aspect of their business is not set up correctly. This podcast is all about empowering you and your business with knowledge and tools to ensure that that doesn't happen to you or to your clients. Let's begin, shall we? Welcome to the Brisbane Professionals Podcast. Uh, my name is Craig Mason. I have with me the other founder of SMS Law, Jeremy Stratton. Say hello to everyone, please, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. You'll notice if you're watching today's show and not listening to it that uh, there's someone else in the window there. Uh, we have a special guest today. Uh, her name is Jackie Strawn from HR Tactics. Uh, and uh, say hello, Jackie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Obviously, we appreciate you giving up the time to come on the show and share all your vast knowledge with our uh, listeners. Uh, Jackie, can you give us a little bit of history of HR tactics and some background about your role within the within the company? Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me, guys. Um so HR, HR tactics, well, I started HR about 20 years ago, uh, going back a fair way. I, I think there's been a few stepping stones along the way that have sort of guided me to this point in, in uh, having my own business, which I've had for about uh, six years maybe now. I'd say one of those sort of stepping stones was growing up in a small business, uh, growing literally around the floor as a baby and and growing and helping behind the counter, serving people as I got older and stuff. But mum and dad had successful small businesses and I think growing up seeing them tearing their hair out a lot around staffing issues. Uh, Another pivotal time in my life was probably working in, in hospitality after my first degree moved into hotels and working in these beautiful properties but really saw the effect that mediocre performance was having on 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 the businesses uh, those who really weren't in it for the right reasons those that had the you know the near enough is good enough uh, approach to five star it just it just really didn't cut it especially overseas you could see um, see the difference so I could see how all that was impacting on 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 the um, satisfaction of other staff, like I guess me who was taking it all very seriously, but also impacting on the on the customers. So I think all those things probably came together in um, later in life and deciding to get move from hospitality over to um, over to HR. Um, I really loved what I was doing in hospitality. I was so proud of those properties, but. But I just had a bit of a utopian view of, um, you know, the best situation will be where all parties, you know, the the employees um, love what they're doing, fully engaged, um, where the employer um, is benefiting from that. And obviously the customers are benefiting from that. So it means they're going to stay, the employees will stay longer. And they'll do a much better job. So that ut- I went chasing that utopian idea of employment, I guess. And, and the only way I could have an impact on, on that was getting into HR. So I went back to university and, and studied HR and um, a lot of stuff around organisational consulting and organisational behaviour. And that led me into a, an awesome 20 odd years in, in HR roles. And about six years ago, as I said before, I decided to go out on my own and started HR Tactics and absolutely love it. So Good I guess point. that's um, in a nutshell, a big nutshell, my my um, background and how I came to sitting here talking to you guys today. 
Yeah, okay, cool. And I know that you have uh, an affinity for the book E Myth Revisited. And I'm interested, do you do you recall what your entrepreneurial seizure moment was? Oh, I don't, Jeremy. Remind me of a, a seizure moment. That doesn't sound so good, does it? Seizure moment. <laughs> it's when you decided that you wanted to start your own business. It's it's when you decided to make to start your own business. Right. I wasn't whether it's seizing the day or having a seizure. You know? Well, hopefully it's not a seizure. Hopefully it's seizing the day, yeah. But Michael Gerber talks about it in the sense when we decide to go from being an employee to being an entrepreneur, he refers to it as an entrepreneurial seizure. And so, so what, like, what was a trigger to start your own business then? <laughs> That's a, a, a better, well, a better ask question. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can't pinpoint one particular moment really, but I I think it was a combination of, of times where I was finding the more senior I got and the closer I was to the CEO, um, the more autonomy I had to come up with my own uh, program of, of, of HR strategies I was developing, but you still didn't have full control over it. And often the ideas I was coming up with from what I was reading about, you know, best practice HR, they, I wasn't able to get traction from the CEO on to pursue those and in the end I just you know I thought what am I waiting for I have so so much knowledge so many years of doing this and I could see I was going to remain passionate for a long time to come in all of it and really it was just taking that leap um probably more of a um uh, seizing the moment uh time was actually reading that book was reading that book and realizing, uh, making the leap from being, um, what did he call it, a, a technician in the business. So yep. me working, yep. doing the HR all the time for businesses and making that leap to um, stepping away and bringing people on to, to be the technicians while I stepped back from that. Yeah, um, yeah so... Uh, anyone who hasn't read that book who's listening to this, uh, grab it if you're having trouble stepping away to work on the business rather than in it. Yeah, and I ask that question because I I know you have you have a, a an, an interesting background with that, and, and I think it's really important for people to think about where they came from um, because it really helps to define where you're going as well. So I think that that's really cool. Um, so you've had a HR tactics for six years now. Where is it now? What's the focus for 2021? Uh, we're in. We're recording this in May 2021, so we're we're already part way through the year. So yeah, what's the focus there? Um, well, we sort of took a hit, like most business. Well, not all businesses, but we did take a hit with uh, COVID as well. Um, so the second half of uh, it's it's starting to build back up. We've recently reached sort of pre-COVID. Um, client numbers um, hitting the the dollars and a little bit beyond that we were pre-COVID. Um, we were about to take on a couple of new consultants. Um, literally the day that Scott Morrison shut everything down, basically, was that the 23rd of March, 23rd of April or something yeah, like about, that? About the 23rd of March, yeah. Yeah, yeah March. Um, I was literally running a session with, um, two new consultants and it all, you know, it all stopped at that point. Uh, so we're reaching the point where yeah, the second half of 2021, I think we'll be bringing on uh, those consultants uh, again, um, which is all very exciting. But yeah, it, um, it, COVID did hit us hard. It was a real flurry of activity in the beginning. Uh, a lot of clients um, and new new clients came to us looking for information, but uh, it became pretty clear that it, uh, a lot of those were going to struggle to get through financially um, um, their business, let alone paying us. So I, I certainly wasn't alone. You guys may have as well. Uh, there was other consultants across finance that I know of, um, across law, across accounting that were really um, 
helping a lot of these businesses out for, for either very little fees or, or for free in the beginning there. Um, I guess we were playing the long game. You know, we wanted to, <laughs> we don't have a business if the, all those businesses go out of business. So um, let's all, you know, suck it up and do do what we can for them in the um, in the hope that we're all going to still be standing in the end. So um, a lot of those businesses were still standing and it's been great for us to build those that deep level of rapport with them, I guess. They can really see that we are a business that leads with the heart and we'll, we'll get to the other stuff later sort of thing. Um, not talking dollars right up front. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be the um, one of the reasons that we will continue to grow in the second part of 2021. So you see what you did in 2020 is something that's changed your industry, but it'll continue for 2021 and on. Yep. From there. So, um, I mean, we get a lot of refer referrals. Um, most of our business at the moment is still referrals. And uh, although that's changing, because uh, we've done a lot of work with SEO and, and on Google and YouTube and different things through 20, that down sort of downtime. Um, but it's word of mouth. People, uh, they ring and they say, hey, I've been told I should talk to you about such and such, you know. We so need you. And um, so that's great. So 2020 has been um, a real help in that respect. Absolutely, yeah. I think, um, yeah, a lot of people put in the hard work in that. It was hard, obviously, 2020 and interesting. But um, it sounds like the work you did then is going to keep you going in the future. So and I'm sure yeah. the people you helped out were appreciative of that too during that time. So. Yeah, no, I was on the phone to uh, to you guys at times. We were all trying to get find our way through, weren't we? Um, you know, the Fair Work Act and all that weren't sort of set up for a pandemic. Uh, no. So there weren't answers to a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people had a lot of money wrapped up in the, you know, in the answers. Um, and then, you know, there were others who were other employers who were going ahead and paying people when they really didn't need to, you know, there was a lot of um, people's hearts really came out of, uh, came out strong during COVID, which was good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we found everyone was playing nice, which um, isn't always great from a, a law firm point of view, but, uh, you know, it was, um, it was good to see. And we'll touch on the fair work changes as well as some other ones going forward. But before we do that, is there anything else you can think of and want to talk about in terms of businesses and what they're innovating and what they've been doing this year that um, you and what you might see unfolding for the rest of 2021? Well, at the moment, it's really about uh, finding efficiencies, I guess, uh, adopting technology, uh, looking for where ways that um, efficiencies can be gained in terms of executing HR processes, but also staying connected with um, those employees who aren't, may not return to the workplace or still aren't returning to the, work, to the workplace and working on site. Um, there's also a lot of movement in the wellbeing space. So you know, 20 years ago when I started in HR, well-being was um, hardly talked about at all. Um, 10 years ago, it, it was starting to be talked about and it was certainly in a lot of um, uh, HR articles and things like that, the RE, um, Australian Human Resources Institute publications and things like that. But uh, through COVID, it's really come to the fore. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's, there's been lots of changes around workplace health and safety, obviously. That's an area of HR that we've been forced to adhere to a lot of strict hygiene guidelines and adopt new ways of working and new ways of servicing customers. Um, but I guess the two biggest areas would be that have changed and are going to uh, continue to be areas of change in HR would be around flexible working arrangements and the management of well-being in the workplace. I mean, flexible working arrangements, it's obviously about the increase in employees working from home and remotely more and more, uh, more than we ever have before. 
um, that, but not all businesses are set up like that. Some of my clients, you know, they're, they're, uh, they just can't work from home, but those who, where they can, um, it's a great opportunity for employees to um, achieve what they achieved before and for some even more um, and have the flexibility to um, handle that around other, other challenges in their life. Um, Interested in that, Jackie, just, just to, to just put, put a pause and just talk about that for a second. Are you seeing a lot of people not wanting to go back to the office? Like, mm-hmm. are, are, they, are they saying that they want to stay at working at home? Because we're, we're seeing a bit of a mixed bag from our side. Some people are going, I want to go back to the office. Others are, no, I, 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 I don't want to. I want to stay at home. Just interested in what you're seeing in, in your, with your clients on that. Yeah, it is a mixed bag, Jeremy. I'm seeing exactly the same thing. So, um Stretton Mason uh, lawyers must be a little microcosm of representing society as a whole. Um, yeah, there's people who don't want to go back to the workplace at all because they are still quite anxious about, um, about COVID. There's others that just want to stay home because they feel that they can achieve more. Um, I'm, I'm sort of one of those when I was working in, in businesses I achieved way more when I was actually at home, but I really enjoyed the social side of being at work. So you can have them both, but uh, you know, for someone like myself, a bit of a hybrid. Um, and then there's there's some that are just refusing to go back to work because um, and you know they're not worried about COVID or anything. They just do not want to do the commute um and and various aspects of their life those ones often have other challenges in life in their days where they want to mix it up and be able to do some work in the morning then take the kids to school and then you know go and do some laps at the pool or something come home and do some more work and then um and pick the kids up but then get back on the tools and it doesn't matter to them what time of the day they do the work uh, and we i guess where we've been management and and um, leadership teams have been forced in some ways through COVID to start trusting their employees a little more um, because some of them are absolutely thriving. Um, but then there's employers who really want to, they still can't come to terms. They can't feel that they can come to terms with it. And even though I have conversations with them, even though they feel the employees are doing a good job at from home, they still want them back in the workplace. <laughs> so they, um, you know, so yeah, you'll get all all points of view, but um, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough. Some mm. are just refusing to come back to work in the workplace. So yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting di- di- sorry. It's an it's an interesting right. dynamic with people not wanting to come back to work and and all the rest of it. It's um it, I think it's a real challenge going forward uh, for a lot of employers. So, um, yeah, and it's something that, yeah. And also, I was going to say, we've got the um, the vaccine issue as well, whether, you know, um, people um, shouldn't be allowed back into the workplace unless they've mm-hmm. had the vaccine or whether that's, you know, going into their human rights, forcing them to get it and, oh, but anyway. Yeah. It's a, that- if, if people was out, was simple i'd be out of a job so <laughs> <laughs> i think that 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 one too that that's going to be a legal minefield going forward and i think that um common sense has to prevail you know depending on the type of role that you have and, and who you're interacting with it's it's going to be a, and it will depend on whether covid's a long-term thing you know people might be listening to this in five years time going what's what are you talking about what's covid what, what are you what was that <laughs> and um well maybe maybe not five years time maybe 10 years so um and hello if you are listening to us from the future um but but um yeah <laughs> but but yeah it, it, it will depend on a lot of factors on that going forward and, and what people's yeah as you say their rights are and, and all the rest of that so it is an interesting field, and and um, there's not. There's, I don't think there's one right answer or wrong answer to who, what happens as far as who has to have a vaccine or not. And I think it's going to be very much on the on the circumstances. Have you had any questions around that? You know, we're in May 2021. Just out of interest, is, is that come up as a topic of conversation about with the vaccine? Mm. Whether the, whether people can be required as employee, can employers require employees to get a vaccine? No. 
interestingly, I haven't had any clients um, discussing it with me so far. I'm just reading a lot about it. So I think it's going to, um, uh, I guess because we are pretty, we're, we've, we're pretty lucky here. We're talking from Queensland here and Australia as a whole. Um, it's, it's not a big issue at the coalface, um, but it's certainly something that's in more the legal sense that's being talked about and written about. Um, behind the scenes yeah absolutely but that um, your question before about you know um, um, changes in the in the HR field and innovations and things like that um, around flexible working arrangements the other thing I was going to mention was uh, well-being in the workplace uh, that's a real growth area as I said it is, uh, 20 years ago there was just no appetite for well-being initiatives and 10 years ago uh, it started to get on the rise. COVID simply sped up a lot of things and well-being, managing well-being in the workplace is definitely one area that's sped up. Um, and it's really about measuring and monitoring well-being factors across your workforce and, and providing well-being initiatives that actually are tailored to to the strategy where you're taking the business and also the type of employees you've got there. There are companies out there that are, are um, working in the wellbeing space that just have one size fits all, I guess, wellbeing strategies. And that's fine as long as the, the business actually looks into whether they are right for, for your employees and they're actually gonna make a difference. We've actually gone the other way. Um, we've got, um, uh, more of a bespoke uh, approach to to well-being and making sure that we do um, speak to the staff, look at the strategy and direction that they're taking the business. And we've made some really key partnerships <clears throat> over recent years, uh, our well-being partners, so that we can be really agile and adapt to what the our clients really need and what's going to make an impact rather than just having a well-being strategy for the sake of it because other businesses and it's the hot topic and stuff we make sure that um, so if you are listening to this and you're considering going down the well-being path because there's a lot of research out there a lot of evidence that um, having the right initiatives in the well-being space will positively impact performance so it is in um, many employers best interest to go down that path but um, making sure that you can, you're, you're selecting what initiatives you're going to have um, based on, on um, what's relevant in your own business. Do you cool. guys, um, with your business, do anything in the wellbeing space at the moment? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, we're always checking in on everyone. Uh, encourage renewal yep. time, you know, getting out of the office, going for a walk, um, you know, taking yep. time to do things outside of work, um, those sorts of things. We don't have a massage chair or a table tennis table, but um, we're still working on that. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, it's not always, it's definitely not always about those sort of things. So um, yeah, as long as, the, as, long as employers uh, and managers are checking in on their staff, um, at the very least, that is fantastic to hear you guys are doing that because we're dealing with humans after all, uh, as long as we can build that trust and keep those connections with them uh, alive and flourishing, um, then uh, everything really comes from there. They've got to feel that um, it, they're in a trusting relationship uh, at work. We spend a lot of time there. So, um, so yeah, check-ins are really vital, having the little boundaries around their, around their relationship with you. Yeah, absolutely. I was on mute then. I was agreeing with you. But, uh <laughs> Just so going on from the well-being in, in terms of the fair work changes. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about there that's that's changing with the fair work stuff? Yeah. Do you mean? Yeah. Well, um, I can run through the um, so give a brief overview of the of what the changes are and sort of what it means to means for businesses. Is that 
That'd be great. Yeah, let, let's go through that because they're changing. Well, they're changing very shortly, aren't they? Um, for, for casual workers, so let's go there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the changes came in um, the end of March, but there is some. Uh, uh, 27th of September is sort of another milestone, another date on the horizon. So, so yeah, the five changes. Um, the first one is we now have a new definition of casual employment. Uh, it's been a long time coming. And uh, so if an, if an employee agrees to no firm advanced commitment to continuing an indefinite work, when they're first offered employment, well, that will make, that will be the determinative factor in assessing whether they, uh, whether or not they are casual. Now, that's with regard to certain entitlements. You've probably heard that the cases like Rosato and Skeen in the past um, uh, were looking as though employers might have to uh, back pay certain types of casuals for annual leave, uh, sick leave, and all this sort of stuff. So uh, that has now um, been straightened out. So in contrast to previous approach where casuals, uh, where the federal court adopted an approach which considered that the nature of the relationship and hours worked, uh, once the employee, once the casual is employed, that was the determining factor. I'll give you an example. Somebody working in hospitality, um, brought on, employed as a casual, um, doing regular and consistent hours prior to these changes, could have uh, gone, gone, put in a claim for back pay um, and been back paid annual leave, um, um, carers leave, sick leave, um, God knows who, how far back. Um, that, as long as the employer now, as long as the employer now has a has a document, an employment contract in place saying that there is no, uh, they made the offer saying that there's no um, guarantee or commitment on advanced commitment to continuing an indefinite work then uh, that employee now has no right to, no claim to back pay. So there's, uh, I'll, I'll slip through briefly the things that employers have to do to make sure that they are clear of the, all that back pay um, in a moment. But the second, so other than there being a definition for casual employment now, the second change is there's now, um, they've introduced a casual employment information statement. So you might've heard of the, the uh, fair work information statement. Now there's another one uh, which has to be given out to all casuals. So um, a new casual loading offset provision um, is in place now. That's the third change and that's to avoid that double dipping. Uh, the fourth change is there's a new requirement for some businesses to offer casual conversion. So they're creating a pathway for casuals in businesses with 15 or more employees uh, for those casuals to transition into permanent employment. And the last, and just a, a small, I guess in some ways, hopefully we don't have to use this too much, but a small change was a small claims procedure for casual conversions disputes. So there's just now another opportunity, another option for um, disputes around casual conversion to be to be heard in the legal system. So essentially the government's now clarified what being a casual really means and introduced that formal process around moving casuals into permanent employment, um, which is that casual conversion piece. So those are really the, the crux of the changes, but um, it's going to mean um, some additional administrative burden on employers. Um, they really need to be reviewing the wording in their casual employment contracts. And if it doesn't reflect the new definition of casual employment, they really need to amend it. And if it doesn't stipulate that the casual, uh, things like the casual loading that their casual is being paid, is a separate identifiable amount and that it's paid in compensation for thing, those permanent entitlements, then um, they may not be able to um, wangle out of having to back pay, back pay casuals who are found 
to be doing you know regular and consistent hours so that's one thing that they really need to start doing looking at the casual employment contracts and the wording in there mm. um the second thing they really need to start doing is handing out the casual employment sorry the employment information statement the ceis handing that out to existing casuals straight away and making sure that you've got something in your like your onboarding processes um, your checklists or whatever you have to remind you of what to do when a new starter comes on board right? so that um, you're reminded all the time to give it out to new casuals that come on board but the big one is prior to September 27th this year um, businesses with uh, 15 or more employees need to complete an assessment or a review of whether their existing casuals meet a, a series of casual conversion criteria. So it's a list of things that um, you, you need to implement a process. If they do meet that those criteria, you need to implement a process whereby those casuals are actually being offered permanency so whereas before those casuals could request they could come to you as the employer and request to convert to permanent now if you've got 15 or more employees um, you actually have to proactively offer permanency it has to be in writing um, and provided to you know part-time or full-time permanent contracts to those if they accept the offer to convert so Yes, a more administrative burden for the employer, but at least we've got clarity now and that we can, doing these certain tasks can make sure that you will avoid um, avoid that double dipping and having mm. to back pay people if they make a claim. Yeah, and that's a, I think that's a good thing. It's, it gives some clarity for business owners. So I think that's really good. So so that's what a business owner should do. And as, as you know, most of our audience for this podcast is are, are professionals, who, professionals who help their business owner clients. Is there any key lesson or key thing that the professionals should do, say accountants, other lawyers, should look at for their clients and, and what they should do just so that they're covering their clients and protecting their clients going forward? Yep. Okay. Well, I guess you can break it into if you've got, if you're listening and you've got less than 15 employees, um, review your employment contracts in light of this new definition and making sure that you've got in there that the casual loading is being paid in lieu of uh, these other permanent entitlements and amend your onboarding processes so that you're doing things like giving out the um, the casual employment information statement. Um, if you're listening and you've got uh, 15 or more employees, so in the eyes of Fair Work, you're not a small business, uh, again, review your employment contracts uh, in light of the definition and get the wording right in there. Um, they, may, they may have the wording in there that, that you know, won't require you to make any amendments. But, um, and, Again, amend your onboarding processes so that you're giving new casuals the statement. But for you guys, make sure you set a reminder in your calendar or something, whatever your processes are, so that you're uh, uh, reminded of the 12 month anniversary um, of all your casuals. Because at that point in time, you've got 21 days from that anniversary, 12 months anniversary date, you've got 21 days to um, make the offer in writing. So um, offer to convert them to permanent. So, um, and the before 27th of September, the big one, 15 or more employees, make sure you're auditing your current casuals eligibility to convert. And on all that, um, there's information out there if you go looking for it. But if you want a shortcut, you can on our website, on our HR Tactics website, we've got um, um, tried to make it really simple for people and actually go ahead and create checklists. Um, we've got our blog there, which um, you can listen to or read about the changes and what you need to do. But, but then I've converted uh, the information into checklists so you can just work step by step uh, down and, and um, made it as simple as possible for everyone. Absolutely. And we'll put that in the, the show notes. The other thing they need to do is get a, get a Jackie in your life. 
uh, from a <laughs> business point of view or socially too, if you're so inclined, uh, <laughs> because, you know, we're pretty big on the, the show about talking about talking to your advisors, getting advisors, getting a team together. And one of those should be, should be Jackie, um, if you can, or someone else in the HR world, but obviously Jackie for purposes of today. And seek their advice because, you know, if you've got a heap of casuals, for instance, there's some big changes that you need to be aware of um, and there's plenty of other things as well. So get a Jackie in your uh, life. Just yesterday I was working with a company that's got about uh, 80 staff and about half of them are casuals. And so it's a really big, (laughs) big task to go through. So I got out my own checklists and I was working through managing the whole conversion stuff for them. Um, And yeah, just making sure they're compliant because the downside of being found non-compliant is pretty hefty financially. Um, Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Is there anything else you wanted to share today, Jackie, with our listeners? Well, Jeremy, if you have any other questions. No, do you have any other questions, Jeremy? Uh, the only other thing I was going to say, other than um, people going and having a look at that fabulous resource about these changes, uh, how can people get in contact with you, Jackie? Yep, um, lots of different ways these days. Um, you've got on our website, you've got um, phone number there, web, um, sorry, uh, email address, it's really simple. My email address, you can email me directly, Jackie, J-A-C-K-I-E, at hrtactics.com.au. Um, you can text me on the mobile number. Uh, contact us through the website on various pages. There's different ways that you can contact us there. There's even a HR Q&A section on the front page of our website. So if you did have a burning HR question and you want to get an answer for free, <laughs> you can um, throw the question in there and I'll personally personally uh, come back to you with an answer, uh, something that'll get you moving in the right direction um, on, you know, giving you clarity as to how to handle whatever situation that may have been referring to. So, Great. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, we, we salute you for giving up your time to come on today's show. I know everyone would have got a lot out of that. I uh, encourage you listeners to get in touch with Jackie if you've got any questions uh, and the same goes with us uh, like us on Facebook uh, follow us on Twitter search for us on LinkedIn uh, connect through those platforms and we share information uh, and other you know commentary through those platforms and if you did enjoy the podcast today one small favour uh, could you rate and review uh, the podcast so any uh, five-star reviews uh, appreciated. Uh, get on the whatever platform you're listening to it and review so other people can see that and go, wow, what a great podcast and what great guests they have. Uh, I think that's it for us today. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Jackie, for taking the time today. Right. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure.